morning, good morning, Oana Church. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning on live. Please feel free to share this link. I want to encourage you this morning with a scripture that comes from Psalms 30, verse 4. And it says, Sing praise to the Lord, you his godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Let us pray. Father, this morning we come before you, Lord, lifting you up, magnifying your name, giving you glory, Lord. God, we just praise you and we thank you so much for being the only God that we serve, God. Thank you for being a graceful God. Your grace is sufficient. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we pray, Lord, that you will open up the hearts of all those who are viewing this this morning, God. And God, may you not just bless the service, Lord, but may your word, Lord, as it says, your word says in scripture, Lord, that your word will go out and not come back void, God. May it go out and do what you have sent it out to do, God. May you speak to the one that is listening this morning, Lord, that needs you. Lord, may salvation come out of this this morning, God. And Father, as we praise you and we worship you, may you speak to us, Lord, in such a way, Lord, that we would really take the time to look at our hearts, Lord, the things in our hearts that does not bring you any glory, Father. So as we praise you this morning, as you work on our hearts this morning, May we hear you, and may this be life-changing as we proclaim the gospel this morning. Father, we praise you and we thank you. We love you for loving us first. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, and God's honor said, Amen. Have a blessed service. Aloha, Ohana. Let's worship our Savior and King, who's resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit, so let's pray. Holy Spirit, would you lead us as we worship you today in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. This freedom, know you captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love, I've got true love instead of pain. This freedom, know you've captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. Joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. You give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Never been so free, God, in your love for me. Never been secure knowing your heart knows never been so free God in your love for me never been more secure knowing your heart knows never been so free God in your love for me never been more secure knowing your heart knows never been so free God in your love for me, never been more secure knowing your you give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. You give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. You give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. You give me joy. Hallelujah. 
Let's remember that Jesus was without sin. He's the lamb without blemish. Yet when he was on the cross, God placed our sin on him and took the wrath of God in our place. So let's sing this song in remembrance of what Jesus has done. He is so good.
Christ to the one whose blood has pardoned me. Oh, what a Savior, Redeemer and King, love has rescued me. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever believes will not perish they shall have the eternal For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Whosoever believes will not perish, they shall have eternal life. They shall Eternal life, Hallelujah. We shall have the eternal life. XY9 is a global network of over 700 churches worshiping in 50 countries with nearly 30 languages, and we are committed to planting healthy, multiplying churches in every corner of the world. God is a global God, and that He works through different ethnicities and cultures and languages around the world. Being faithful to God's great commission is to make disciples and to plant churches. Churches characterized by theological clarity, cultural engagement, and missional innovation. We believe that uh, the church is God's primary mission strategy for establishing His kingdom and His presence on earth. We want to reach people with the gospel. And our reach is amplified through Acts 29 as a mantle. So more people will know and worship Him. Each one of our members has been blessed by all the training that we have received as planters. We want our church to be a praying church and also a church that disciples others. This is what we do and this is who we are. We are people who plant churches. So Acts 29 accomplishes its mission uh, primarily through three things. By assessing potential church planters. We provide continued assistance for churches and leaders through coaching, trainings, and also relational connection. We get to collaborate with the whole Bride of Christ to plant churches, not only just in our areas, but we partner globally to plant churches. And as we partner together with Acts 29, with churches around the world, our efforts are multiplied and the God is glorified when we work together as a church. This is Acts 29. 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 Good morning, Ohana. Thanks for joining us again on this online season of Ohana Church. We're thankful that you're here this morning. But in the video we just watched, we saw that this Sunday is the Acts 29 Church Planting Sunday. And so as we, as we watch this video, there's something that stood out to me, is that Acts 29 is a proponent of planting not only churches, but healthy churches. This is a vital aspect to look forward to and, and to pour into because we want churches that we plant to last more than just 
eight to 10 years, but we want them to last generations. We wanna see the keikis that grow up to be able to take over and multiply even more churches. That is why this ministry is so important to us, but also why we get behind and fully support this ministry. Acts 29 has helped us throughout the years from when we first joined in a couple years back, they helped us through lava relief and they helped us with individual projects. But we love Acts 29. And in this season of being online and being away from the physical gathering, it is more important than ever to give financially to support these ministries. We give monthly to support Acts 29 through our overall budget. And so as we give, you are crucial to that. You are a part of that process. You are a part of making churches in the overseas, the, those 30 countries or those 30 languages that he talked about in that video. So would you join us in giving generously this morning? Just a reminder, there's a couple ways you can give. You can go, you can give by texting 84321 with the amount and give that way. You can also go to ohanachurch.com and backslash give and give through that platform. And lastly, you can drop it off in the mailbox at the church um, if you wanna give that way. But we love to live generously. We see the importance of living generously. And as we continue in this worship time of the preaching of the word, may you think hard about giving so we can bless the nations through this wonderful program. Let me say a prayer over this time of generosity. Dear Holy Father, Lord, we come to you and we thank you that you are a generous God. You have given far beyond what we could fathom in the gift of your only son that we celebrated just a couple weeks ago that died on the cross for our sins. Lord, thank you for living generously and, and giving us the grace and mercy that we do not deserve. But Lord, you've given us love, grace, and mercy. Lord, as we prepare our hearts to live generously, may we see that it's more than just ourselves our church, but Lord, we are involved in kingdom activity that goes far beyond what we can even imagine right here and right now. Lord, we thank you for this technology that gives us the ability to give generously, even sitting at home in our couches and our recliners, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this, this time. Lord, may you be glorified in all that we do. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Hello, Ohana. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. We are in the last portion of our study through our verse by verse in the Gospel of Mark. What an exciting accomplishment by the power of the Holy Spirit as we glorify Christ through expositional preaching. And I want to let you guys know that I'm in my office today and a lot of sermons have been prepared right here in this office. If you look behind me, I have a small little library that has been faithful for my study in the last seven years of preaching expositionally. We have preached the book of Ephesians through Acts, through Titus, through Nehemiah, and now we've gone through the book, or we're going to accomplish it today, finishing the Gospel of Mark. It's been a beautiful journey in this Gospel. In fact, as we wrap up this Gospel, how many of you have been blessed by this three years of studying faithfully through this text? I know our family and the leadership of our, t of our church staff has been tremendously blessed by what the, what the Lord has done for us in this gospel. Did you know that we started studying through the gospel of Mark in September of 2018? And did you know through these last few years, we have dealt with a lot of hardship, with a lot of difficulties. In fact, let me remind you on how God remained faithful to us through these difficult times. Do you remember that in 2018, we endured a volcanic eruption? 
Do you remember around that same time we was in the next year in 2019, I believe we were houseless. We were going without a church building. So we had to meet at Christian Liberty in KL for six months. Do you also remember that around this same time we had people who were without houses because they were affected by the volcano eruption that took place? Do you also remember that we've been living through a pandemic, right? There, there's there been many issues, but these are the three main issues that I could think of that came to fruition when we started studied, studying through the gospel of Mark. But we have also seen the amazing hand of God and how he has protected us and he has covered us and how he has blessed us through these last three years. Do you know that in these last three years, we have given thousands upon thousands of dollars away to the volcano victims who were harmed by the 2018 volcano eruption. So much so is that we were able to build a community in HPP for many homes for those who needed those homes. Do you know that also in 2019, while we were going through some of this hardship, God allowed two different teams from our church to travel up to the nation of Japan and do mission work with our international missionary, our international missionaries up there. Uh, even with Pastor June and Praise Church and Grace Church and the Busby's family, God has allowed us to continue the mission even through these last three years of hardship. Do you know that even while we were houseless without a facility, somehow the pandemic, which which was a very tragedy to many churches, many people, has was a blessing to us. No one was renting our old facility at the time, and the new landlords uh, invited us back in to the same property, and you all helped us furnish a new parsonage in the old education space in the back, and we've been meeting here since last April, when I remember getting the keys back, God has blessed Ohana Church. And you know what? Let me remind you, God also blessed us with a new partnership. You guys know Pastor Jacob and Pastor Danny of Impact Community Church partner with us this year. And we had we had the, uh, the availability of preaching at each other's churches. And we have this partnership that is just kingdom minded and focused. And we are coming alongside of them and them alongside of us as we continue to focus on planting healthy churches in the islands. God has been ever so faithful and he will continue to be faithful to our Ohana. I want to remind you that as we've been walking through this gospel of Mark, that we have seen one major theme in this gospel account. And that is that Jesus is our sovereign servant. Even as I sit in this room, many prayers have been said in this room because of how Jesus has served us through the scriptures. Many people were healed in this service spiritually and physically because of how Jesus serves us in the scriptures. A lot of crying, a lot of arguments, a lot of tension took place right here in this room. And if there's anything that, that I can remember this room for is remembering the gospel reconciliation that Jesus continues to serve us with through the power of his Holy Spirit, through the disciplines of biblical theology and study habits, hermeneutics and exegesis and, ex and expository preaching and faithfulness towards the body of Christ with patience and all eagerness to know Jesus deeper together. This has been the beauty of Jesus being pressed out through our lives through this gospel. And I feel like it was only appropriate to say that I'm going to entitle this last sermon as in the series called The Final Days of Jesus. I'm going to entitle this sermon, The Final Sermon. Many of you know that this is the final sermon in the Gospel of Mark with Jesus to his disciples. But I want to remind you guys that this is also my last sermon as I share with you, Ohana Church, expositionally on what Jesus has laid out for us as our sovereign servant. So what I want you to do, I want you to turn. And for this one moment, may we just say we're going to sit in reverence of the word. And I want to read these final verses of the gospel of Mark. 
And you know what to say when I say these words. Mao Kao Kao. Let's read. It says in verse 14 of chapter 16 of Mark. Afterward, Jesus appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. And he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And Jesus said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will be accompany those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. While the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Let's pray. God, you're good. And as I see these, this last word, the word signs, God, I pray that you would reveal to us the true nature of your sign, which is revealed in these words, and that we must proclaim the gospel in all the world. God, help Ohana Church to be gospel-centered, gospel-focused, gospel-urgent. Remind us that the message of the scriptures is all about Christ. And God, as we continue to study diligently in these, in these scripture, that you will teach us how to be submissive to you, how to be totally desperate and dependent on you, how to rely on the Holy Spirit, his work, his manifestation of how the word pricks our heart, him convicting us, reminding us of all truth, bringing back to remembrance everything you taught your disciples and everything that has been passed down through them by the power and work of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, in all the glory and honor and praise that you are due for, may this sermon, the final sermon, be a sermon of gratitude, a sermon of hope, a sermon to love people to the beauty of Christ. It's in your name we pray and we say, Amen. Amen. There's a term that's being used right now in theological circle, circles, and it's called theology applied. And there's a huge battle between two groups of Christians those who have a heavy view of theology, and a second group whose view are heavy in the application of theology. Let me just be very plain and very simple when I make this statement. True theology must be applied. And, and I want you to hear this. And, and when we deal with this theology, I want you to hear that. And what we apply must be theological. Let me say that again, right? True theology must be applied. And what we apply must be theological. I have a concern for both parties that waver one way or the other. I have a concern that we may be just rambling in our theology. That we have Christians and churches out there that is heavy in theology. But the extent of their theology does not go beyond the pulpit of the preacher. It goes through one ear of the congregation and out the other ear. And I'm concerned for that group of people. But I'm also concerned for the opposite group. Where they focus on just application. And the application is being nice to people by doing random acts of kindness to them. You know, And the reality is both platforms right, are true in its nature. But by itself, it misses the mark. We need both strong theology and strong application, right? True theology must be applied and what we apply must be theological. And these, these things together must be married, must be one, right? 
And what we want to see in the gospel of Mark specifically is that we are in post-resurrection. Jesus was crucified. He was buried. He rose on the third day. And Jesus is doing his final sermon with his followers, specifically the apostles, the disciples. In Luke's account, Acts chapter 1, Jesus spends 40 days preaching about the kingdom of God. So we are right on day 40 in Mark's gospel account. And Jesus shows us the importance of theology theology applied. So here's two theological applications given by Jesus in our text today. Number one, we see the great rebuke. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 is very clear, right? The word rebuke is used in verse 14. In fact, rebuke means to call out someone because of their sins. In this case, in verse 14, Jesus rebu rebukes his disciples and marks accounts why Jesus rebukes his disciples. First off, their unbelief. They no longer believed in Jesus, specifically what he reminded them before his death. And because of their unbelief, they were hardened in the heart. They did not believe Mary, Peter, and John from verses 11 and 12 on Jesus' appearance to them. So these men who saw Jesus do miraculous things and even told them of and how Jesus told them of his death, burial, and resurrection, they have all become callous in the heart. These are the elite followers, Ohana. These are the elite followers of Jesus, handpicked by Jesus himself, and they have become faithless. And it is at this very moment we see Christ's faithfulness and love towards his fallen disciples. And he displays this through a great Rebuke. And I want you to hear this life application real quick. Part of gospel living deals with rebuke. Listen to me, Ohana. Part of living in the gospel, living out the gospel deals with rebuke. A mark of a true Christian is one who either gives or receives correction, which is another word for rebuke. Why must Christians, right, partake in correction? Well, let's look at the Old Testament first. Proverbs 22, verse 15 says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. Now, let me tell you, we are all foolish in nature. This is us to the T. As humans, we are sinners. Therefore, the result of our sin is folly. It's foolishness. Let's jump up to the, back to the New Testament. Romans 3, 23 says, This is what, this is why. Correction is important. Why? Because for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? And listen to me. This is not this message of correction and reproof is not just for lost people that need to hear the gospel. This is everyone. Primarily in this text, it's for God's people, his disciple. Uh, even these elite disciples who have become callous in their own heart. After following Jesus for three faithful years, Jesus has to correct them. Jesus rebukes them, right? And so this is the way I would say, right? Thank God for correction. Wherever you are, would you thank God for his correction? Thank God that he, re re he rebukes us. In fact, look at what Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says about correction. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves, another word for correction and rebuke, right? For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. I want you to see that while the disciples chose not to believe Mary, Peter, and John about seeing Jesus earlier, God in his divine goodness still appeared to these doubting followers. Listen to me. This is the doctrine of grace. And I want you to see something beautiful about what the Bible displays on this doctrine called grace. Grace says God gives to us what we don't deserve. Grace says God chooses whom he will save. Grace says God will not abandon us 
even when we even when we abandon him. Grace says God is faithful to those he saves. Grace says, if not for God, we are all doomed. And isn't this true for our text today? Grace is lavish. Grace is freely given to these apostles and these disciples after they have doubted that Jesus rose from the dead. You see, part of God's grace revealed to those he loves includes correction, rebuke, Reproof. Why? Because God delights in his people. That's what the psalmist says. Second Timothy 3.16. We have preached this text inside out. Even faithful speakers from other churches who have visited our church has preached this text. It says all scripture is breathed out by God. Get ready for this, right? Profitable for teaching, for reproof. For correction and for the training in righteousness. Listen to me, Ohana. If you are like these disciples, if you have fallen into the trap of disbelief and a callous heart, know that Jesus has given us a great rebuke today in the scriptures. He rebukes us to love us back to himself. Listen to me. Don't run from it. Embrace it. For the Gospel of John, Jesus said this bestly. He says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's Listen to me. It's only when this happens, rebuke, correction, reproof. When this happens from Scripture, by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Through the acknowledgement of Jesus Christ. When this happens, we can all lock arms and listen to the next charge Jesus gives to his disciples in our text today. And before we move forward, listen to me very clear. It is good for correction. It is good to be rebuked. It is good to be reproofed. This is how God loves his people. He loves his people through correction. Why? Because we are sinners by nature. We constantly sin. We are in in constant rebel to God apart from him. We need intimacy with him. We need intimate fellowship with him. And that only happens through Christ. And when those things take place. And by God's grace, when we embrace his correction, his rebuke, his reproof, it is at that very moment we can move to our second theological application in which we see in our text today, the Great Commission. And this is a very popular term. It's only used in the gospel accounts of Matthew and Mark only, but in verse 15 of chapter 16 of the Gospel of Mark, it says that Jesus proclaimed his sermon, his final sermon in this way. He says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. I want to break down this short little text in a few ways. First, let's address who Jesus is speaking to. Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples, right? Uh, now, let's let's start there, okay? Let's not try to add ourselves in the text. Let's be faithful to who Jesus is literally talking to at this very moment in the text. His 11 disciples, some of the women that were there as well, okay? Let's, let's say it. Jesus is talking to those he spent three years ministering alongside with, all right? Secondly, let's see the simplicity of the task Jesus gives to his disciples in verses Fifteen. First off, he tells them, go into all the world. Secondly, he says, proclaim the gospel. Right. Thirdly, listen to this. He says, do this to the whole creation. Notice what he is not saying in the text. He's not saying feed the homeless. He's not saying do block parties. He's not say, saying build a church building. Right. He's not even saying to do a cool theatrical presentation of the gospel. And listen to me. I don't think the Bible is against that. I don't think Jesus is against that. However, 
It's possible that we have replaced the simplicity of the gospel message with many of these platforms just mentioned. Listen to me, the gospel is the verbal articulated word of Jesus Christ. It begins with bad news for you and me. It begins that with all of us that we are sinners in front of a holy God, that by that nature of itself and its reality, we deserve the worst punishment of all. The bad news is, is that we deserve hell. We deserve to be separated by God. But the gospel comes in with good news. And it says because of what Jesus has done, that we can know God intimately, passionately, purely, scripturally, right, spiritually, because of what Jesus has done. Therefore, Jesus emphasizes not to do all these attractional events that we're used to doing, specifically here in the Western world mindset or American Christianity, but specifically to proclaim the message of the gospel. That we are sinners in need of God's mercy. We are sinners in need of God's grace. We are sinners in need of God's love. And that is demonstrated through Jesus' sacrifice for you and me. I pray that the gospel message never gets old at Ohana Church. That we will always, as I prayed earlier, be gospel-centered, gospel-focused, gospel-urgent. Why? Because the gospel is the only message that can save us. The gospel is the only message that can reconcile us. The gospel is the only message that has the power to give us life, new life, in Christ alone. So I want you to see that. Thirdly, Look at the results of the gospel message. Look at verses 16. Jesus says, whoever believe will be saved. But secondly, whoever does not believe is condemned. This word believe, I want you guys to note that this word believe is not a belief that we are we are automatically but in our nature birth with it actually happens in the second birth the only way one can truly believe is that god's spirit has re regenerated the sinner into life therefore our belief is simply the gift of god this is a, has been our our scriptural memory verse this week in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace we have been saved through faith. This is the gift of God. All right. So, so the reality is we're saved in the gospel message completely by God's sovereign grace. For anyone to be able to believe is because God lavished his grace and mercy and love on sinners like you and me. And so verse 16 is clear. Whoever believes will be saved. Whoever does not believe is condemned. Thirdly, we also see in verse 17 and 18 that signs was promised to these disciples. Again, right, we're, we're talking to the disciples directly. Signs were promised to the disciples. Uh, it says believers will cast out demons Jesus said that believers will speak in new tongues. Now, let me be very clear. I believe this is not a gibberish language. I believe this is a known natural tongue because the gospel message is used with words. So and I, we know this in this account that in all of Acts, we have seen this gift uh, lived out. These known languages lived out in different areas of the globe for the advancement of the verbal articulated gospel of Jesus Christ. But also we see that believers will survive snake poison. Now, as you look at this, there is actually an account in the book of Acts when Paul is bitten by a snake on the uh, on, on an island called Malta. And he actually survived that attack. And when they saw that he was survived that serpent, that venomous serpent attack, P, that sign was an extra, how would I say, an extra use for people to believe in the message of the gospel. In my conviction, I also believe that when this is used as a serpent, 
in concordance with the entire history of the church and all through scripture, I believe this is also a form of persecution that Christians who are persecuted by venomous false teachers and people who just hate the hate Christianity and in an opposition, all right, they will endure, whether by life, by death, they will endure the message to proclaim. I think Paul said it greatly in I think it was Philippians, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And what, what scholars believe is that when he made that statement that um to live is Christ, meaning that as long as he can be persecuted, he can be beaten for it, he can be thrown into prison. But as long as he breathes, he's going to continue to advance the gospel. And we know that because he wrote 14 letters in the New Testament through, throughout all of this persecution. But we also know that at his final breath, he went to be home with the Lord forever. So to live is Christ, to die is gain. Jesus promised his disciples, you will cast out demons, you will speak in new tongues, you will survive poison. And, and lastly, that you would heal the sick. Jesus promised this 11, right, and the 12 to come who would be Matthias in Acts and also an extra apostle who would be the apostle Paul. He said, you guys will experience these signs. Now, there's a lot of debate on these verses, specifically with those who hold on to the strong charismatic or Pentecostal doctrine and practices. I believe God works supernaturally. That everything stated has been seen through the scriptures. However, I want to argue that the emphasis of the Great Commission, right, of the Great Commission is not the supernatural manifestations, but rather, listen to me clearly, the simplicity of the gospel message. And I can prove that to you by reading exegetically and expositionally in our text, in our final verses of 19 and 20. Read this with me. Look at it. It says, so then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, right? After he preached his final sermon to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. We see this account also in the first chapter of Acts, Luke's account. Look at verse 20. I want to be very clear. Watch this. And they went out and preached everywhere. While the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. I want to break this down for us today, all right? First off, we see the disciples obeyed Jesus. They went out. Look at verse 20. They went out. In fact, in church history, we know where they, their lives ended based on the advancement of the gospel. The apostle Matthew, his life ended in Ethiopia. And he was speared to death. James, who we believe is the brother of Jesus, was thrown off the temple in Jerusalem and clubbed to death. Jude went to Persia and was crucified there. John died in exile on the island of Patmos. Only, the only one to die a natural death out of all the disciples apostles. Matthias, who takes Judas Iscariot's place in the book of Acts, is stoned and beheaded. Philip is hung by iron hooks. Peter is crucified upside down in Rome. Thomas, he is speared in India. James, the son of Zebedee, right, also the brother of John and the sons of thunder, was beheaded in Palestine. Andrew, the, the brother of Simon Peter, was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. Simon, a different Simon, the zealot, was crucified in Persia. And Bartholomew was whipped to death in Asia Minor. You see this? So, so we see that they obeyed Jesus, the disciples. They went to the ends of the earth, the known world at the time. Secondly, we also see that the disciples preached everywhere. But thirdly, the Lord worked with them. Look at the text. In verse 20, right, it says that the Lord worked with them. And also, number four, the Lord confirmed this message. What is the message? To proclaim the gospel in the whole world. right? And then fifthly, the Lord accompanied this message with signs. Now hear me out. Just some clarity. 
Not every gospel message in the Bible was accompanied by signs. This is why I think it's probably a good argument that we focus in, in this text, that Jesus is talking to his disciples. I can see the argument of the, 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 sensationist, the sensationist group who believe that some of the signs and gifts and vision have ceased to exist after this period of time because of the role and office of the apostle. Now, there's a lot of debate as I say this. People are going to disagree, right? Specifically, the charismatic Pentecostal holiness movement will disagree with what I'm about to say. I can see that argument. But I can also see the argument that God can do whatever he chooses to do. He can use signs and wonders. He can heal people. He can show visions. Yes. I, I, and as you listen to me, I'm still struggling with my theological comprehension. But if I'm going to weigh heavy on the hermeneutical understanding of this text, what's in context, what's in front and what's behind of this entire text, I think it's very clear that what's emphasized in these verses is the preaching of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now hear me out. Beware of those who have made the gospel message much more than the simplicity of the, the word of God being preached. Beware of these people. In my world's religion seminary class that I'm taking this semester, and in the, in the contextualization of reaching Muslims, there is a part of folk religion, which is, which is not based on traditions or traditional doctrine or proof of beliefs, but it evolves into mystic emotionalism and experiential, uh, experiential events and encounters. That's what folk, all, all religions have different styles of folk isms in their practices and beliefs. And one of, one of the institutes of Muslims or folk Muslim deals with mystic practices. And one of the issues in Christianity being able to reach these Muslims, right, is the issue with the charismatic and the Pentecostal practices of mysticism in the Muslim faith. Now, I grew up in this de this denomination, this charismatic denomination, one of the biggest ones in the world. And I want to be very clear with everyone today that I don't hold to these doctrines anymore. I believe a lot of it is fanaticism. A lot of it is not based in scripture. It's all emotional. I'm not saying that every Pentecostal is, is not a true believer, but they are being deceived by false doctrine. And I want to be very clear that the best and the true way of seeing people saved in Christ will always be through the message of the verbal gospel. Even without manifestations of miraculous signs and wonders. Because I believe the gospel is verbal. The gospel is used with words. And as the Apostle Paul states in Romans, how will they hear if there is no preacher in Romans 10? And then later on in the text, it says, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of Christ. And that's where salvation begins. Therefore, I want to warn you all that to beware of those who simply believe that you need an outer body experience or a mystic feeling, emotionalism, right? And to In order to experience Jesus. No, the word of God is sufficient. The scriptures are enough. Dr. Robin Dale Hathaway says it this way. He says, God brings power encounters at the time and place of his choosing. Christian workers who attempt to encourage others to seek these encounters risk falling prey to the very folk practices they desire to expose. What it's saying, 
that there is no difference from folk Islam and folk Christianity. Folk Christianity is trying to reach folk Islam with the same exact tactics, mysticism, emotionalism, experiences. But what cuts the heart is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God in our in verse 19, he continues to be our sovereign servant through the proclamation of the gospel. Therefore, I believe at this point, we can hear the words from Jesus for ourselves today as Christian. So we must adhere to the gospel. Therefore, preach the gospel, study the gospel, sing the gospel, pray the gospel, share the gospel, give generously with the gospel, confront people with the gospel, rebuke people with the gospel, reproof others with the gospel. Jesus tells his disciples in these verses, proclaim the gospel, proclaim it in all the earth. I want to end our sermon with one of my favorite preachers of all time. He's not with us anymore, but he's known as the Prince of Preachers. Charles H. Spurgeon says this. I hope it encourages you, Ohana. Now, my brethren, we have power. We are God's ministers. We preach God's truth. The great judge of heaven and earth has told us the truth. And what have we to do to dispute with worms of the dust? Why should we tremble and fear them? Let us stand out and say, we are the servants of the living God. We tell unto you what God has told to us. And we warn you, if you reject our testimony, it shall be better for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. If the people cast that away, we have done our work. We have nothing to do with making them believe. Ours is to testify of Christ everywhere, to preach and proclaim the gospel to all men. I pray that has encouraged you today. How should we respond in listening to this text as Jesus preaches his final sermons to his disciples and by the power of the Holy Spirit to us today? How should we respond? Very simple. Proclaim the gospel and proclaim it until Jesus calls us home or until he returns for us in all his glory. Ohana Church, I love you. It has been my joy to faithfully preach the gospel to you for the past seven years. And I encourage you to embrace this same gospel. And as you embrace it, remember how we live this out at our at our, at our fellowship, by gathering, by growing, and by going. Let's continue to fight for the gathering of the saints. Let's continue to grow theologically, and let's apply it as we go from Hawaii, throughout the Pacific, to the ends of the earth. Thank you for allowing me to preach this final sermon as we prepare for glory. Again, I love you with all my heart. It is my joy to have been a co-laborer with every one of you. I pray that by God's grace and mercy that we are able to meet one last time in person next Sunday, April the 25th, right here at this church, even if it's just to hug each other and, and say our ahui ho, right? Would you pray with me one final time? Jesus, Thank you for your gospel. I pray that if there's anyone that's watching right now that don't know you as their Lord and Savior, that through this prayer, by the preaching of your word, your Holy Spirit will prick their heart and draw them into the family of God. God, would you give them a new heart? And for those that know you, God, would you sharpen their hearts? Would you call them to the mission field would you raise up pastors? Would you raise up godly husbands and wives, godly children? Would you raise up the next generation of leaders to lead the kingdom, to lead people into the new kingdom of God that's to come, that's promised to us? 
Lord, will you raise up theologically, uh, theologically uh, people that, that understand your word by the power of your spirit, that study, and don't wait last minute to study, but they are faithfully, whether they are a pastor or a layman in the church, they are faithfully studying your scriptures. Holy Spirit of God, do some extraordinary things. Heal the sick. Cleanse the drug addict. Break the sinner. Restore marriages. Restore relationships. Holy Spirit of God, do what you've promised in your birth, in your Bible, in your word. We love you, God. We need you more than ever. We're desperate for you. Lord Jesus, have your way. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And God's Ohana says loud and proud. Amen. I love you, Ohana. Ahui ho. Malama pono ke akuapu. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. And thank you, first timers, as well. We'd love to stay connected with you. So email us, connect with us on social media so we can do that. I want to celebrate our scripture memory we did this week. We memorized Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Congratulations to all of you that did memorize that passage, and if you didn't, please join with us in doing that. I want to celebrate next, Ohana Church's seventh birthday is coming up. Tuesday the 20th, Ohana Church celebrates seven years. It's exciting, and we are looking forward to celebrating together in person next week. Next week is also the Tomaselli's final Sunday with us. They've been getting ready, packing and preparing for their big move. And so we are really looking forward and really hoping to be able to join in face-to-face -face worship next week, Sunday. Finally, I leave you with this passage from Psalms 46.10. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. We look forward to seeing you next week. Ahui ho.